Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. We're broadcasting on a prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and simulcasting on 1865 kHz in the 160 meter amateur radio band. Also transmitting through the Melbourne TV repeater VK3 RTV digital channel 2. Very pleasant evening to the viewers up there. We're also streaming via YouTube which can be found, the channel can be found on the ASV website under the, uh, the URL of www.asv.org.au under the Radio Astronomy tab at the top of the page. Click on the Radio Astronomy tab and uh, you will see the corresponding link to the ASV broadcast and that's where the YouTube is. Uh, also we have a chat window, a Discord chat window which is available from the same page. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, come up and uh, as, uh, as yourself or as an alias um, or under an alias, so totally up to you but we're monitoring the chat window as we speak and uh, we also have an active email address dedicated for the session here uh, which is vk3ekh at gmail.com vk3ekh at gmail.com Alright now tonight's a little bit uh, of a different uh, arrangement um, I have a special uh, podcast recording courtesy of Brendan O'Brien uh, of the astrophys.com podcasts that he does. Thanks Brendan if you're listening and uh, tonight's uh, session is a 40 odd minute interview with uh, Jill Tata uh, so I'll uh, I won't uh, carry on too much I'll uh, go into it because it'll be dedicated to uh, pretty much most of it the session tonight um, but uh, just briefly um, it's uh, episode 138, Astrophys episode 138, so it's hot off the press. <laughs> uh, it's the most recent uh, release for uh, Brendan's podcast, so it's quite, in fact, last Monday. I think he put this up on his uh, astrophys.com website. But uh, Dr. Jill Tarter is uh, um, of some value. I mean, all, all the uh, interviewees that... Uh, Brendan's done a raw value of course, valuable, and we'll get through them all. As you know, I've been working my way through the um, the podcasts that uh, Brendan's done, but I've just decided to jump to this one because I just thought it would be worthwhile. Um, a, a kind of a, a biography on Jill Tata, for those that are not too sure. Uh, Jill Tata received her Bachelor of Engineering Physics degree with distinction from Cornell University and her master's degree and a PhD in astronomy from the University of California, Berkeley. She served as project scientists for NASA and uh, SETI program, NASA SETI program, the high resolution microwave survey and has conducted numerous observational uh, programs at radio observatories worldwide. Since the termination of the funding for NASA's SETI program in 1993, uh, she has served in a leadership role to secure private funding to continue the exploration or the exploratory science. Currently, she serves on the management board of the Allen Telescope Array, an innovative array of 350, when fully realised, 6 metre antenna uh, at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory. It will simultaneously survey the radio universe for known and unexpected sources uh, of astrophysical emission and speed up the search for radio emissions from other distant technologies by orders of magnitude. Tata's work has brought her wide recognition in the scientific community, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from Women in Aerospace. Two public service medals from NASA, a Chabot Observatory's Person of the Year Award, 1997, 
Women of, the, of Achievement Award in the Science and Technology category by the Women's Fund and the San, jo jo San Jose Mercury News, 1998, and the Tesla Award of Technology and the Telluride Tech Festival, 2001. She was elected an AAAS Fellow in the 2002 and a California Academy of Sciences Fellow in 2003. In 2004, Time magazine named her one of the most 100 most influential people in the world. And in 2005, Tata was awarded the Carl Sagan Prize uh, um, for Science Popularization and Wonderful Fest. The biannual San Francisco Bay Area Festival of Science. Tata is deeply involved in the education of future citizens and scientists. In addition to her scientific leadership at NASA and SETI Institute, Tata was the principal investigator for two curriculum development projects funded by the NSF, NASA and others. The first, the Life in the Universe series, created six science teaching guides for grades three and nine, published 1994 to 1996. Her second project, Voyages Through Time, is an integrated high school science curriculum on the fundamental theme of evolution in six modules, cosmic evolution, planetary evolution, origin of life, evolution of life, hominid evolution, and evolution of technology, published in 2003. Tata is a frequent speaker for science teacher meetings at, uh, and at museums and science centres, bringing her commitment to science and education to both teachers and the public. Many people are now familiar with her work as portrayed by Jodie Foster in the movie Contact. So uh, that's Jill Tata and uh, Brendan O'Brien's uh, had a chance to uh, pick a uh, a time that was uh, suitable for uh, for Jill to uh, come up on the internet line and to conduct an interview. So uh, I shall go across to that in just a second. Um, uh, there was something else. Oh yes, uh, to, for some of you that might not have been aware, uh, a little bit earlier on tonight there was a, uh, a live uh, Zoom uh, interview with Dick Smith uh, that occurred for one hour uh, between eight and nine o'clock. Um, I don't know whether the uh, Zoom meeting was, uh, I think it was recorded, uh, but uh, whether it will be uh, uh, available for playback, I'm not too certain. Uh, I may uh, try and find out about that uh, because we might be able to get a chance to put it across the, the TV system here. I, 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 when I came up here, I, was, I felt certain somebody would have been running it, but uh, there was nobody up on the repeater. So I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get a hold of the uh, Dick Smith interview. Um, conducted by uh, Peter VK7 Hotel Hotel, I think it was. I can't recall right now. Not too sure about that. Uh, but you had uh, uh, Scott, uh, the president of uh, WIA, was there, and uh, a VK4 chap, uh, uh, Peter. Um, can't remember call signs right now. But there was four, uh, and of course Dick Smith. And it was quite hilarious listening to uh, to Dick uh, talking about. Uh, his various uh, projects when he had the uh, the shop uh, Dick Smith, uh, <laughs> it was quite a giggle. Um, so he's quite a character, and uh, he's just released a book. Um, I can't recall what the book's called right now, but anyway, uh, I suspect that if um, for those that are pretty uh, familiar with YouTube, um, the rerun of tonight's interview with Dick Smith uh, should be easily available. Uh, not uh, not too far into the future, if not already, perhaps. Um, yeah, anyway, it was good, and uh, I, I thank uh, VK7. I think it's Hotel Hotel, uh, to uh, who uh, created that Zoom interview. It was uh, very well done indeed. Um, okay, so that was that. You're tuned to ASV Radio. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with the uh, regular Friday night broadcast. Uh, coming to you from the studios of Narry Warren South in VK3 CSJ. There you go. Um, information about the Astronomical Society of Victoria, which we do this on behalf of, can be found uh, on the ASV website 
at www.asv.org.au and uh, all will be revealed. We're uh, all getting ready for um, the Christmas barbecue. The uh, the barbecue is going ahead. Um, uh, it's the 11th of December, I think it is. Uh, 11th of December. Uh, booking is required. We, we need the ASV needs to know the numbers. Uh, so there is a, a ticketing system in place, which can be addressed via the home page of the. All, all that information is on the home page of the ASV. Uh, a very pleasant good evening too to uh, Phil and uh, Steve who may be up at uh, the site at the Leon Mao Dark Sky site uh, as we speak. They're, they may be listening on our uh, on Steve's little uh, radio up there. So uh, a very pleasant good evening to you guys, and um, um, yeah, good luck with what you're uh, what you're up to uh, this uh, this weekend. Uh, all right, now okay, uh, let's see if we can kick this off. Um, I shall. Well, I've actually for for the uh, visual side. I hope this works. Actually, um, because the interview goes for about forty minutes odd. Um, I, I thought that because uh, I didn't really want to have a fixed slide up for that long length of the time, because it, it, it's just an audio recording. Uh, so I've created a PowerPoint uh, presentation of sorts uh, with multiple images of Jill Tata in various. Uh, um, stages of her life and uh, I'm hoping that I can play that for the, the visual side of the uh, the broadcast whilst the audio part goes. <laughs> so let's see if this all works uh, for me. Um, let's see, let's see, it's that part there and uh, get that going first. Um, yep, that's all queued up. So all I need to do is just click that and that should start that off, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, I'll have to also mute my speaker because uh, uh, if I don't mute the speaker I get some funny things happening too, so stand by for that. Uh, this is VK3 Echo Killer Hotel, uh, about to present a uh, interview uh, just conducted uh, in uh, the last uh, month, I guess it would have been, uh, by Brendan O'Brien of the astrophys.com um, fame and uh, sit back and have a listen to Jill Tata, Dr. Jill Tata, talking. To one of this planet's foremost SETI researchers, Dr. Jill Tata. Hello, Jill. Hello, how are you, Brandon? Very well, thanks, Jill. And I'm quite awestruck out here in an isolated part of rural Australia to be zooming across 18 time zones to California. And it's such a pleasure today to speak with Dr. Jill Tata, who is Emeritus Chair for SETI Research at the SETI Institute. She served as Project Scientist for NASA's SETI program and has spent 35 years at the SETI Institute a non-profit organisation she helped launch in 1984. She and the SETI team are scanning space for signals that could reveal intelligent alien life. And she recently stepped down as the director of SETI research after 28 years and is one of the most lauded and accomplished SETI researchers on our planet. And it would take the whole podcast to list all of Jill's amazing achievements. And we can't do that. But it's important that our listeners know that they're hearing from the person who's been named one of the time 100 most influential people in the world and the inspiration for the character of Ali Arroway in Carl Sagan's Contact, a role played by Jodie Foster in the film. And thanks for speaking with us, Jill. And I hope you and your family and friends have all been safe from those terrible wildfires you had in California last summer? Well, we have some rain today, so that should be the end of our wildfire season. But uh, they have been pretty spectacular, fortunately not affecting anyone um, around me. But uh, they did threaten the observatory at Hat Creek for a while. Wow. Okay. Okay. So... 
Before we talk about your SETI work, your rich research program, your outreach work and the Ellen Array and Breakthrough Listen, can you tell us where you grew up, please, Jill, and how you became interested in science and space in the first place? And I did read a story about you when you were a child walking along the beach in the Florida Keys with your dad. And listeners can hear this great story direct from Jill in an NPR interview at tonyearl.com forward slash Jill Tata or lowercase. But first, a bit about your background. I grew up in East Chester, New York, which is a commute town outside of New York City. And I spent all of my weekends and free time with my dad, hunting and fishing and camping. My dad had been a professional football player and I was his only child, so I was the son that he got to have, and I loved it. But at one point, I think maybe seven or eight years old, my mother clearly had a talk with my father, and uh, my father then had a talk with me. And when my father and I had talks, he sat me up on a washing machine so that I could be eye level with him. And he said, your mom thinks you should be spending more time with her learning how to do girl things. And I don't think there was anything he could have said that would have made me angrier. So I slammed my fist down and I said, I don't know why I can't do anything that I want to. Oh, that's wonderful. So after finishing school, you completed an undergraduate degree in engineering physics at Cornell in New York. Then it's 3,000 miles right across America to UC Berkeley, where you did your MA and then your PhD on brown dwarfs. And you are credited with coining the term brown dwarfs in 1975 during your doctorate research. Now, some astronomers refer to brown dwarfs as failed stars, while others dub them superplanets. What are brown dwarfs, Jill? Well, brown dwarfs form like a star, that is, they accrete, but they don't have enough mass to get hot enough at their centers to fuse hydrogen to helium stably. They do it for a short period and then they just continue to collapse. So you never get this stable nuclear fusion, which is what makes a star shine. I was trying to figure out what these might look like to observers, because my thesis advisor and I were wondering if these small things might account for what at the time we called the missing mass in the galaxy. We now call it dark matter, right? But back then, uh, I was trying to make a model for these stars and trying to predict their colors. And I couldn't, our opacity tables were so poor at low density and low temperature that I actually never could fit an atmosphere onto my model. And so I didn't know what color they would be. So I called them brown because Edmund Land, who was the inventor of Polaroid, had once said brown is not a color. (laughs) So they became brown dwarfs and it took another 25 years before they were ever actually found. And now we see them in great abundance. Oh, yes. And that's so cool in many ways. Okay, then you worked on your first SETI search, which you called Serendip, the search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. And this was at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory which was later to become the home of the Allen Telescope Array, which we'll hear about a bit later. But first, could you tell us about your work at Arecibo as the project scientist for NASA's high-resolution microwave survey? Right. So NASA got interested in SETI in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And we did what you do in NASA. we, We held a bunch of workshops to try and figure out how we should do it. And the first thing we had to figure out was, gee, do other stars have planets? Because we had no idea. They, the only planets we knew about were the ones in our own solar system. So we set off 
with working groups to try and figure out how to detect planets if they existed around nearby stars. And Bill Baruki, who was the lead scientist for the Kepler spacecraft mission, was part of that working group. That's how Bill got interested in looking for planets. And almost 25 years to the day after that first workshop, the Kepler mission was launched and it was extraordinarily successful. And it told us that indeed, essentially every star has at least one planet. Yep. We got, got all got started with SETI and we felt good about that. And then we decided that as the Cyclops report, which had been published in the early 70s, which was a workshop again between NASA Ames and Stanford, which suggested that if you wanted to find extraterrestrial technologies, you should build an array of 100 meter telescopes, 1600 of them, right? Mm -hmm. The price tag on that project was rather high. It never got done. And we learned a lot more about interferometry in the subsequent years. So when NASA got around to deciding they wanted to do a SETI project, and they didn't want to start with interferometry because that was too hard. So we looked around the globe for large single dish telescopes. And we were going to use the Jodrell Bank Telescope in UK, the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, the Nancé Telescope in France, and of course, the Parkes Telescope in Australia. And so we wrote memorandum of understanding and we got permissions up the chain to use the funds that we had to to buy time on those telescopes and then when congress terminated nasa's seti program i immediately called up the directors of those telescopes and said if i can find the money can i still have the time Yep. And that was the first step in, in Project Phoenix and rising from the ashes of congressional termination. And that's what we set off to do, to find the money so that we could continue to go to the telescopes with the special purpose equipment we've been building and try and complete the search that NASA had intended. But we could only complete the targeted search part of the NASA project because it was supposed to be Model. It was supposed to do sensitive searches of a number of targets, about a thousand stars, but then also a complete sky survey. But the sky survey depended on using the 34 meter telescopes of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or the Deep Space Network. Yep. And when we lost the NASA funding, we also lost the, the Deep Space Network. So we did do the targeted search, and I think we did a very good job, and we learned a lot of things, um, but we couldn't get to the sky survey. That's only been picked up again in the last few years. But that didn't stop you. There's plenty of projects like Project Phoenix um, come through, and a little diversion here, and would you like to talk about the relationships that scientists can develop with their research tools? like? A lot of us teared up when Cassini flatlined on Saturn a couple of years ago. And you mentioned before the Parks dish. We have a deep affection for it here in Australia, and uh, that's on a national level. How did SETI scientists respond to the collapse of that beautiful Arecibo dish? Oh, that was just so heart-wrenching. We had spent lots and lots of time observing at Arecibo. We had great relations with the scientists and the technicians there. We really enjoyed using that telescope, and we actually helped them to allow remote observing, because when we observed it at a telescope, we have to take control of the telescope with our equipment. Yep. So we helped them take the first step at making that telescope available for remote observing. And the Puerto Rican culture loves Halloween and Christmas and um, All Saints Day. And we would decorate the control room where 
piece of it that we worked in for all these different holidays that we spent down there. We went through a couple of hurricanes at the telescope and it survived those, but uh, not this last one. And uh, not, you know, those, those cables. I actually have a picture of me sitting on one of those cables 500 feet above the dish. Ooh. It was a very special opportunity when a French newspaper sent a photographer to Puerto Rico to do a photo shoot for a spread that they were doing in Le Monde. And by putting up a one-day insurance policy, the photographer and I were allowed to climb the tower and go out on that, those cables. And so I, I know how big they were. I know it's just unimaginable that they could actually snap. Yeah. And what a treasure that photo must be. Thanks, Jill. Okay, let's get back to the science of SETI, the wow signal. It's an important part of SETI history where Jerry Amon famously annotated a computer printout with the word wow to designate an anomalous signal back in 1977. Could you talk us through the process of signal analysis and how that's changed over time? And what are the current protocols? What do they look like? Is it all AI now? Not all, but we're starting to get into that business, which is really good. The wow signal. Well, first, I'm pretty rude about saying that if I had been running that Ohio State search, you would never have heard of the wow signal because it was really early days, right? Very, very crude computing. Yep. They had a transit instrument. So you don't pick up that big football field and move it around. You can tilt one end of it. So the sky goes overhead and they had a plan where they had two receivers the east receiver and then the west receiver, and a signal that was coming from the sky and moving at sidereal rate like a distant planet might, would pass through the east receiver, die away, and then be picked up in the west receiver. Yep. Well, this wow signal didn't do that. It only went through one of the receivers and they don't know which one. So there's a big swath of the sky where the signal might have been coming from, if indeed it was coming from the sky. And over the years, a number of observers have used various different radio telescopes to relook that area of the sky to see if that signal could be recaptured. But for me, I don't think it's fair to change the rules after you start observing. So we have a certain set of criteria that an interesting candidate has to uh, satisfy before you actually take it seriously. And if it doesn't pass those criteria, we just add it to our uh, list of interfering signals. Yep. And so the wow signal didn't pass the tests that they had set up in advance, but it was so strong, so unusual, that in fact, they got excited about it. In our case, we observe with two telescopes or in the case of the Allen Telescope Array, 42 telescopes. Yep. And we have to see the signal in each of the telescopes and it has to have the correct time delay, Doppler and Doppler shift to be appropriate to a signal coming from the sky. And if we see it, and we see it in a second antenna, then we go back and we reobserve it. And then we do that, go through a cycle five times, and we have to see it each time. And we have to not see it when we're pointing in another direction. So if a signal survives all of that, then our phones start to ring. Indeed, and may they ring loud and often. Uh, we had a similar situation down here in parks where the parks dish was um, catching the sound of a microwave oven being opened. Yes, the peritons. 
Yes, indeed. Okay, let's take on now another important tangent. And can I ask you to tell us about the impact of Frank Drake's famous equation and how that has evolved over the years? Well, I think it is a fantastic way to organize our ignorance, but I'm uncomfortable with calling it an equation because yep. that makes people think you can solve it, that there's an answer to that. And really there is no answer. There are just a lot of unknowns and it helps us to think about all of the conditions that are probably required for life to exist somewhere beyond Earth. But the last term in that mathematical construction yep. is L, and that stands for the longevity of the technology that is emitting and that you are trying to find. And that is completely unknown. I mean, we've had an appropriate technology for 100 years, so maybe you can say that's a lower limit to L. But what might be the upper limit? I mean, we live in a galaxy that's 10 billion years old. Most of the stars in our neighborhood of the galaxy are a billion years older than, than the sun. Uh, what is the limit on that number? And given the huge uncertainties, it means that you really can't calculate anything with it, but you can tell a good story. You can get people involved with thinking about what's necessary for life and technologies to exist somewhere else. And hopefully we can encourage people to practice environmental, just environmental practices, which will make us uh, survive longer rather than shorter at the moment. There's certainly some big questions out there and a lot of work that we have to do. Look, I always include a couple of questions that open the door for you. Would you like to tell us about perhaps the possibility of life in our solar system? Like uh, we know a lot about extremophiles. Would you like to talk about rather than distant life at the moment? But what about life in our solar system? That seems to be getting closer all the time. Well, there certainly was a lot of interest in Venus in this past year when a claim was made that um, phosphine gas had been detected in the cloud levels of uh, twin planet. And it got everyone excited because when we went through all of the chemical matrices of how we know to create phosphine on Earth, it always involved biology. And so did phosphine mean that there was actually some kind of life floating in the clouds of Venus? So people got really excited and uh, lots of back and forth. In the end, it now seems like the identification of phosphine, which was only a single spectral line and not a family of lines, was probably incorrect. And probably what we're seeing is sulfur dioxide. But nevertheless, it got people thinking about what Carl Sagan used to call floaters, sinkers, and bobbers, life forms that might exist in the clouds of Venus. And of course, we're really interested in looking for evidence of life on Mars, either extinct or maybe even extant subsurface life in liquid water aquifers. And we're going to, to great lengths um, to explore that planet. And we're also trying to be very careful that we don't take life to Mars and contaminate it, right? So we, um, there are international protocols set by COSPAR about what kinds of levels of sterilization are required for spacecraft that are going to be on the surface of a body or could possibly fall out of orbit onto the surface of a body. And we are eager to do that exploration before humans get there because we humans are so dirty 
that will contaminate the planet instantly. So we'd really like to look for life while it's still pristine. And if we find this evidence, you know, that Brenda, there's a, another question we have to ask, which is, are we Martians? So early on, Mars was wetter and warmer about the time that life was getting started on Earth. And it was also the case that in the early solar system, especially, but still going on today, rocks get swapped between Mars and, and Earth. Yep. In our meteorite collections, we actually have pieces of Mars, little chips of Mars. And we know that it's Mars because of the, the content of the gases that are frozen into these rocks. So what if life started on Mars and then got chipped off and, and hid away inside a rock and got transported to Earth and seeded the Earth? Might life on Earth be related to life on Mars, early life on Mars? So exciting things to think about. In terms of the other bodies in our solar system, well, Enceladus and Europa, giant moons of Saturn and Jupiter, have cryovolcanoes spewing out of their south poles. And we would love to fly through those plumes and collect samples and analyze those samples to see if there are any biological molecules, building blocks of life. Because we have these sort of black smokers at the bottom of the ocean, and we think those might be a good model for what might be at the bottom of the oceans on Europa and Enceladus. And there's lots of life around the black smokers. Maybe there's lots of life on the bottoms of the oceans on those two giant moons. We'd like to investigate that. And hopefully we will, and who knows what chemicals or organisms are hitchhiking on comets and asteroids that are yet to reach us. Right. Okay. Look, I know our listeners would love to hear about the current SETI projects and their associated technologies. First of all, can you tell us about the Allen Array or FAST or CHIME or Meerkat or Parks and how powerful instruments are being harnessed as we speak into SETI projects like Breakthrough Listen. That's correct. Breakthrough Listen has been buying time, renting time on very large telescopes around the world. And they haven't been building receivers. They usually use the telescopes at the frequencies that are already accessible. But what they have been doing is building these absolutely exquisite signal processing backends. So when we started with the Serendip project at Hat Creek all those years ago, we had 100 spectral channels that we could investigate. Today, the Breakthrough Listen systems that are based on um, PGAs and GPUs, they have billions of channels that they can look at simultaneously. And so they're in a mode of single dish observing where instead of using multiple dishes and using requirements to see the signal in each of the dishes, they're using single dishes and they're nodding on source and off source and on source and off source and requiring that an interesting signal be seen when they're looking on the source but not when they're looking off the source. If they see it both on and off, it's interference and they discard it. But the signal processing hardware and the algorithms that they're developing are really, really wonderful. And in fact, there are terabytes of data that Breakthrough Listen has put out for anybody to explore and try and develop new signal processing algorithms on. So that is available in the public domain. And they will be going, let's see, they're using parks, they're using the GBT, they're using the automated 
Planet Finder at Lick Observatory to do an optical search. Ooh. They are working at Jodrell Bank. They are beginning to operate at Meerkat and intend to continue as Meerkat grows into the square kilometer array. They can t- intend to continue that. Um, they're working with FAST to build instrumentation. The Melora Widefield Array is also being used. So mainly these telescopes are being used in what we call a commensal observational mode. Ah, and they are beginning to work with the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico, again, in this commensal mode, which means that you make a copy of the voltages as a function of time coming out of each telescope. And then you can analyze your copy to look for engineered signals, while the astronomer uses their copy of the data to do whatever the observing program that they proposed to do was. And so when you're observing commensally, you can't point the telescope. You get to look where the astronomers are looking. But in some sense, uh, we can't definitively say that we know where to point and when. So this commensal data allowing us to be on the air almost all the time is terrific. And I think we will be doing more of that and it will be augmented with new algorithms that are developed by artificial intelligence. So in the past, when we looked and analyzed data, we asked our computers, does this particular pattern in frequency and time exist in the data? So we told it the type of signal that we were looking for. But now, as we get to benefit from artificial intelligence, we in fact can say, look at this data and tell me if it contains any information. We don't have to specify in advance the pattern. So we can allow for a larger number of modulation types, a larger number of signals that we may never have thought of before. And the machine can be told, get back to us when you find some information content. So it's a new mode. It's a a new threshold or frontier for SETI. I think it's great. Fantastic. Bigger eyes and ears all around. And it's great to hear that the breakthrough listen data is being um, put online for people. I remember a few years ago, I and many, many uh, others were involved in a citizen science project called SETI at Home, where we donated the um, the cycles on our computers when we weren't using them to analyse data for a SETI project. Yeah, I think SETI at Home put uh, citizen science and distributed computer on on the map. I mean, it wasn't the first to use distributed computing. There were some folks who were trying to um, factor Marcine primes and things like that by spreading the work around a number of machines. But SETI at Home was so sexy, so inviting, that it really did get citizen science up and running. And now, of course, with the Zooniverse network, you can do anything. Yeah, there's so many great projects around now in citizen science. It's just wonderful. Now, everyone's hoping that the James Webb Space Telescope, which is being launched soon, hopefully on the 18th of December, everyone's hoping it'll be a game changer. And what are your thoughts about the JWST and What about other future technologies? How can you see them contributing to SETI research? Well, it's very important to ask precisely that question right now because James Webb and Space, the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the move and um, evolution from 10-meter optical telescopes to telescopes that are 30 or 40 meters, We'd like to think more broadly about what they might image that might be an indication of someone else's technology. So we've talked for a long time about trying to analyze the atmospheres of distant exoplanets, looking for biosignatures, looking for evidence of disequilibrium chemistry that might indicate life on the surface of the planet. But now we're trying to ask ourselves, 
what might this new generation of much more powerful telescopes show us that would be an indication of a techno signature? So here's one example that radio astronomers can appreciate. So we've been studying pulsars for years, and you at Parks and other places have huge databases of pulsar signals. And a pulsar typically has a very precise period. But what if it changed from one period to another period? And indeed, we've seen this in the data because sometimes there are star quakes on the neutron star that change its moment of inertia, so how rapidly it can rotate. But what we've never seen, but really actually might be in the data already taken, or we might find it in new data in the future. We've never seen a pulsar that went from one period to another period, and then back to the first. But indeed, that almost natural signal would end up getting caught in the surveys for pulsars. Yep. So that might be a techno signature. We can come up with other kinds of things about mirrors, orbiting planets to bring uh, a tidally locked planet to bring light to the, the um, far side of the planet. And what might the glint from such mirrors look like? We can think about lasers, uh, accelerating light sails, and what might those monochromatic laser signals look like as they brush past the Earth. And so we're trying to really expand our thinking and not just talk about radio signals, but talk about techno signatures. Yep, fantastic. And FRBs, there's some amazing data coming out from them as they, we're finding more and more of them now. It's 2021 now, and almost we're into the second year, well and truly. COVID 19's had uh, a huge impact worldwide. How has COVID impacted on SETI research? Well, it's certainly closed some observatories, and it has made it more difficult. Uh, to get together. We certainly now have gotten very good at having global Zoom meetings. So meetings that, in-person meetings that would have had a regional draw in the past now have a global audience. So that's been good. And we're going to need to keep, when we go back to in-person, we're going to need to keep a component of this virtual meeting because I think it's allowed us to have a much greater, greater reach. And the other thing that COVID has done in a very negative way is something that I hope that SETI can do in a much more positive way. And that's to make the point that we are all connected. And so when I talk to audiences, I try to get them to have a more cosmic perspective of who they are and where they are and when they are. Talking about SETI, I think, has the effect of holding up a mirror to everybody on the planet. And when we look in that mirror, we see all these different faces, right? But in fact, that's not the story. Those faces aren't different. Indeed, when compared to life that may have started and evolved on a distant planet around a different star, we are all the same when compared to that other life. And if we want to have a long future for life on this planet, we have to adapt that we are all the same. We are all Earthlings' point of view, because the challenges that we face for climate change and water and food security in the future are, are going to require cooperation and global solutions to these challenges. So we ought to begin to think of ourselves as earthlings and act that way. And hopefully for a long time, thanks. Now you mentioned audiences. 
you've got a, a long history of doing lovely outreach work and the internet is full of your talks and interviews and prize-winning TED Talks and books about you like Making Contact and hundreds of your articles and your research papers and podcast interviews. And you've written a lot of curriculum for school children. And can you tell us about the breadth of your outreach a moment and why, apart from the mirror, why is it so important to you? Well, we have known from the very beginning that it is probable that this vast exploration that we are undertaking is going to be a multi-generational project. And therefore, we have a very vested interest in training our replacements. So it's natural to think about the future and how do we get young people, in particular, in my case, I have a bias for exciting young girls about careers in STEM fields and growing up to, to replace us. So it's a natural. Young people like dinosaurs and ghosts and creepy crawly things and ET. So if you build a curriculum around this question of life beyond Earth, it doesn't feel like a struggle to learn. It's a story in which you are involved and you are part. And so the, the science kind of goes down easily. And it's, it's something with which young students can relate. Okay, thanks. And um, to follow up on that, your brilliant career has been devoted to the big existential question for humanity. Are we alone? Why are big questions like this so important, Jill? Well, what are we most interested in? We're most interested in ourselves, right? And we would like to calibrate where we fit into the cosmos. Are there others? Are they smarter than us? Are we more technologically advanced than some others? And given the fact that we only have the physics that we understand today and the technology of the 21st century, that will limit the kinds of things we can look for. But we're doing it to figure out whether we are unique in the universe or we are a standard outcome of chemistry and physics that plays out all over the universe. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a very important outlook. Um, we all struggle with it, Jill. Thank you. Now, the mic is all yours, and you have the opportunity to give us your favourite rant or rave about one of the challenges that we face, you mentioned women in STEM before, girls in STEM. What challenges do we face in the lack of diversity or opportunity in science communities, in outreach, in science denialism or career paths, or your own passion for research or that big quest for new knowledge? The microphone's all yours. Well, I like to tell young people that a career in STEM, in science and engineering, is a real privilege because you get to do each day what it takes to answer questions that you have posed and you are interested in. It's not just sit down and do what your boss tells you for eight hours a day. It's how, how can I possibly use my skills to figure out something that no one else has ever figured out before. And that's, you know, it's puzzle solving. It's a game. It's a great pleasure. And it is a privilege. It's a very satisfying way to spend a career. So I, I usually tell people, young people, find something that you like to do and then do all the hard work to get better at doing that thing than anybody else. And it'll probably take years of schooling and, and you know, 
again, it won't be easy. But once you're better at doing that than anyone else, you can take your skills and you can use them to solve all kinds of different problems. You don't have to work on the same thing all your life. You can take your skill set and go find a problem that needs solving that you think is interesting and go for it. That's my, <laughs> that's my rant. <laughs> and that's fantastic. I'm sitting here with a huge smile on my face right now. Okay, so is there anything else we should watch out for in the near future? What are you keeping your eye on? Well, I'm mindful of the funding roller coaster that SETI has had throughout my career. For now, thanks to the contribution from Yuri Milner, another five years or so of stable funding. But I actually am trying to figure out how we can build an endowment for SETI. And that endowment can stay in place and we can live off and do our SETI research and work and observing from the interest. So again, with this idea that the program may need to be multi-generational, universities have understood this over many generations and they do a very good job with this idea of an endowment. So that's what I'd like to spend some time on now in my career to try and see if we can set up an endowment for SETI that can keep going into the foreseeable future and eliminate these funding fluctuations. Fantastic. Sounds a, a bit like the model for uh, the funding of the Nobel Prize, the SETI Prize. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jill Tata, on behalf of all of our listeners, it's been really fabulous and an unmitigated honour to be speaking with you. And thank you especially for your time in your incredible schedule. And congratulations on all your great work. You're an inspiration. Thanks, Jill. Thank you for those kind words, Brendan. Bye-bye. And for those who do the socials thing, you can follow Dr. Jill right this is vk3 <clears throat> vk3 echo kilo hotel vk3 ekh and i have no audio there we are there's audio now um okay one two one two one two right we're back yes good evening everyone <laughs> uh you've been listening to uh, vk3 ekh the official station of the astronomical society of victoria with a uh, a uh, rerun of uh, an interview just recently done with uh, Dr. Jill Tata and uh, courtesy of uh, Brendan O'Brien um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, excellent inter interview so I hope that came across uh, uh, everywhere I think the YouTube stream and uh, the ATV side of it went very well but uh, uh, as usual on HF it might have been a bit difficult to uh, copy some of those uh, and a bit of the dialogue I, uh, I said to Brendan um, uh, via email that um, uh, he needs to, to uh, now follow up uh, uh, with uh, an interview with uh, Seth uh, Sostak. Sosh, 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 <laughs> tired. Um, this bloke. Uh, There it is. Okay, back, back again. Yeah, uh, Seth uh, Shostak, uh, who directs the search for extraterrestrials uh, at the SETI Institute in uh, California and uh, trying to find evidence of intelligent uh, life in space. And um, uh, so uh, he'd be a good follow up. In fact, Seth and, uh, uh, and Jewel have worked uh, together for many years uh, on this uh, one endeavour. So. Uh, Seth has uh, got a, an equal uh, name for the for uh, his uh, career in the science as uh, as Jill has too. So um, yeah, let's hope that uh, Brendan can get uh, Seth in on an interview in the near future. That'll be fantastic. <laughs> um, all right, now uh, I can see we're coming up to the hour. I might just go a little bit uh, overboard because um, the other thing I'd like to mention too is that. Um, the, there is a movie uh, or a movie documentary uh, type thing being released 
on the Arecibo telescope. It's uh, it's it's got um, it's a theatre. It's uh, um, running in the theatres uh, over there in in Puerto Rico on the second of December. Um, when it will be screened for the rest of the world to see, I'm uh, not too sure at this stage of the game. Uh, suffice to say that um, uh, what have I got here on it? Um, it's called the biggest dream. The biggest dream. It goes for an hour and fifty-five minutes. Uh, basically, a documentary. Um, the loss of the, B, the the Billy Gordon radio telescope has left a void in the uh, the world of radio science. The mountains that cradled it, and the hearts of many visitors and enthusiasts who appreciated the beautiful engineering marvel. It's a difficult time for the scientists who's, uh, who grew up seeing the telescope every day in the fields of the atmosphere science, planetary science and radio astronomy, experience their legacy of a 57-year 50, journey from the small island of Puerto Rico to the deepest regions of the galaxy with the world's most powerful telescope. And um, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's called The Biggest Dream. Just check out the trailer. In fact, I, can, uh, I, can, I, I actually do have uh, a small... Little, no, it's not that. Um, let me sit back to this one, and I think where have I got that? Uh, yeah, let's see if this works. Uh, of course, this is a, a visual thing too for uh, the uh, repeater in YouTube. Um, let's see how it goes. Well, you know, it was in 1959 when they started building the Arecibo Observatory, 63 when they finished building it and it saw first light. But what led up to that time of starting in 1959? Well, the key person here was Bill Gordon. What Bill Gordon said is, hey, if we build a big enough, fine enough, high quality instrument, we'll be able to use a different return from the atmosphere, incoherent scatter. something new that hadn't been done before and is not that easy to do. Now you might say, why so big for doing this incoherent scatter? It was the beginning of the space age. Asteroids are moving in space, not only orbiting around the sun, but they are also rotating. So with Bennu and Osiris Rex and Dark mission and this legacy of our receiver, we had a record number of detections in the last few years. Now what? La ciencia está llena de misterios y tratamos de buscar soluciones a estas preguntas. Was there any doubt among scientists about whether this was a good project? There's a lot of work to be done. What would have happened if we didn't have those radar observations? So as I see it, there's a lot of mysteries in the universe that we need to solve. The tool, that is, the physical instrument, but what it left behind will be part of mankind for generations to come. Right, um, I've got to remember to uh, bring up my microphone when I, when I do that. All right, so there you are. That was, a, like I say, a very, uh, it's a trailer, just a two minute uh, trailer on uh, the Arecibo telescope, the uh, the biggest dream. And uh, that's uh, being screened uh, in the 1st of December and uh, we'll go worldwide uh, in uh, a short time thereafter. So look out for that one. I'll, I'll let you guys know uh, when that's uh, going to be. Um, uh, uh, made available. Uh, so it looks to be quite exciting little uh, documentary. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Uh, um, just uh, checking spaceweather.com. Of course, as you all know, we had a, a partial lunar eclipse tonight. Uh, absolutely no visibility here in Melbourne. So uh, Anything of that partial uh, lunar eclipse uh, wasn't really seen here in uh, in Melbourne, unfortunately. Uh, currently, there are two sunspots on the disk of the sun. 
AR2897 and AR2896. The sunspot number is currently 22. The radio sun measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters is at a um, is it currently at a uh, uh, 82 solar flux units and um, come on mouse um, they're just talking about the eclipse here so not much more of that and of course the current uh, count uh, for near earth asteroids uh, hazardous ones at least is 2239 potentially hazardous asteroids always like that figure all right, that's space weather in a nutshell. Uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight's session. Uh, again, thanks to uh, Brendan for uh, um, allowing us to uh, to run that uh, uh, little interview. And uh, we shall conclude transmissions on 1865. Uh, so if anybody uh, uh, wants to uh, call back uh, on 3541 kilohertz in just a few seconds, moments, minutes. Um, and uh, also uh, note that the uh, uh, Richard VK3 VRS has told me that the uh, Dick Smith interview uh, is um, if you type in if you go to YouTube uh, and type in uh, Ham Radio DX I think you'll get it um, yeah I think uh, Ham Ham Radio DX is the what uh, it's titled under and uh, you'll see this one hour interview uh, with uh, uh, Dick and uh, <laughs> there are quite some interesting funny moments in that um, and it was uh, VK so it was uh, Hayden. Uh, Hayden VK7 Hotel Hotel that um, uh, organised that it appears. So this is VK3 EKH uh, with VK3 CSJ on the microphone concluding transmissions on the medium wave service tonight on 1865. Thanks for those that have been listening there uh, and uh, we'll be back at, at 10 o'clock next week, next Friday to do it all again. Um, so, uh, standby stations on 80 metres. This is VK3 EKH. For more information about the Astronomical Society of Victoria, go to www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. Good night, uh, stations listening on 1865. This is VK3 CSJ concluding on 160. Okay, standby stations on 80. Uh, volume up and. Uh, I'll get the headphones on. Oh, I should be alright, I think. Oh no, I have to take them off because I don't need them. Don't need the headphones. So, uh, this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541. VK3 VIN. Okay, we've got VK3 VIN. Who was the other station? VK3 uh, VK3 November Zulu Charlie. Okay, VK3 VIN, VK3 JR, VK3 NZC. Who else is there? That's okay. <laughs> All right, g'day, in VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH. Yeah, g'day, Clint. VK3 EKH, VK3 VIN. And I heard another voice that I recognised. G'day, Barry. Nice to hear your voice, VK3 NZC. Um, yeah, very good. Another nice, another good broadcast, uh, Clint. And uh, for people that might be struggling to, um, to get the best audio quality on uh, sideband, I suggest that if you can, you uh, listen to it on a wider filter. Uh, when I turned my... Um, high end up to uh, 4 kilohertz and 5 kilohertz uh, perfectly good uh, quality audio from from that uh, interview still had its limits but uh, nevertheless uh, very um, intelligible audio uh, content was very good and um, uh, I don't know that I understood everything but just Hearing the uh, depth and the um, uh, the range of uh, uh, Jill's uh, expertise and history uh, was uh, was terrific, and uh, I, I liked the uh, the part where she said to her father, "Why why can't I do what I want to do?" Um, and uh, <laughs> perfectly perfectly acceptable, understandable, and reasonable. Um, and 
Yeah, the question is, why not? Uh, why be restricted to girly things? Um, I don't know that gender has any part in uh, uh, scientific or any other ability. You can either do it or you can't do it, whatever. Anyway, good broadcast. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, email I sent you has the report, but your usual 5 and 9 plus 20 to 30. Uh, occasional um, uh, QSB down to 10, DB out of 9. But um, very comfortable to listen to. VK3EKH, VK3VIN. Thanks, Ian. VK3VIN at uh, Kangaroo Flat. VK3EKH, Nari Warren South, replying. And thank you very much for uh, the kind remarks. And uh, I totally uh, agree with your um, uh, opinion on the audio. Um, I, uh, I, I transmit fairly uh, a reasonably wide uh, signal. And uh, uh, well, I mean, within the, the restraints, but um, the Pro 3, um, the Icon Pro 3, um, has a, a kind of a wide uh, facility. I, you know, I think a four kilohertz or so would uh, in the SSP mode, but it, it is. I'm running a little bit of an enhanced audio side of things, and I think um, if you can uh, widen your receiver out as far as it will go. Um, <laughs> I think you'll uh, you have you'll have no problems in getting the uh, the higher frequency components and the and things like that. The sibilance will be there to some degree, but if you uh, have narrow filters, it'll be a bit difficult. To, uh, I can understand that. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, another reason why I have the YouTube stream. I I, I usually have an audio stream running. Uh, I still haven't got that sussed out yet. Um, the problem here, but. Uh, We'll hopefully work on that very soon. But the audio stream is also another mode to be able to listen to uh, the transmissions from here, um, as well as the good old TV system uh, up there. Uh, anyway, thanks, Ian. And um, uh, I, I think that um, the, the majority of uh, the interviews that Brendan uh, has got on his website are. Um, with uh, certainly with women that are uh, that are involved with astronomy, and uh, maybe not so, you know, particularly ones that are not so well known, but are doing very interesting PhD uh, research type study, and uh, Brennan gives them a chance to uh, get there up on the microphone and uh, talk about their their uh, interests. So um, uh, it's quite interesting the the number of uh, lady folks uh, out there that are definitely into astrophotography, uh, not astrophotography, um, astrophysics, and uh, astronomy in general, and uh, doing research in this area. As uh, uh, Jill Tata was saying, she's uh, very keen to um, uh, to uh, you know, nurture the the interest in uh, in girls that are, have got a, 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 a bent towards science. So rather than anything else, so uh, it's uh, certainly uh, a good move. Uh, that's what the STEM program is all about. Uh, anyway, um, all right. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, Frank VK3JR, good signal from you. VK3EKH. Good evening, Frank. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say that I'm very
Thanks, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH, returning your uh, peaking almost 30 over 9. Um, uh, Frank, that's uh, <laughs> a likely good signal coming in from you tonight. But uh, yeah, thanks, Frank, for that. And uh, we'll continue on with the um, podcast session uh, sessions uh, from next week. Uh, the most uh, most of uh, the interviews that uh, Brendan does are uh, shorter, of course, but he he really did devote um, the most of the the program to uh, this uh, interview with Jill this time. So, uh, uh, and uh, like I say, if you can get hold of um, of Seth uh, Shostak, then uh, there'll be equally uh, a length of time. <laughs> Seth uh, is a, an amazing person to listen to. He's um, um, uh, yeah, he's very, very interesting. I, I think I actually I bumped into Seth once. Uh, well, not bumped into him. It was a, he was in here in Melbourne doing a, a, a talk, um, and uh, I was wearing a, a T-shirt that had the SETI Institute logo on it, and uh, I was wanting to get a signature for one of his books. And uh, as I'm sort of waiting for him to finish uh, talking to uh, the, the folks in front, he. He recognised the SETI Institute logo on the shirt and said, oh, I, I recognise that. <laughs> and uh, so we had a bit of a chat and got him to sign the book. So, um, and uh, I've actually managed to see Jill too, but uh, unfortunately uh, she was in Melbourne uh, just for a quick uh, um, uh, session uh, somewhere, I don't know where it was now, it might have been at Science Works, I think. And, um, uh, yeah, as soon as the, uh, the the session and the question and answers was uh, was uh, done, uh, she disappeared pretty quick after that. Uh, and I actually remembered uh, asking her the question about because uh, this that yeah that's right. Jill, Jill came into to I think it was Science Works at the time. That I think it was uh, late nineties or uh, not too long after Contact uh, was uh, it had been screened at the theatre, and I I, I I had heard that the Ellie Arroway character in Contact was loosely based on um, Jill Tarter's work um, and I, I thought I'd ask that question uh, was that in fact true <laughs> and she kind of rolled her eyes and oh everybody asks me that question <laughs> um, but it's still uh, it's uh, obviously yeah to some degree it was so um, yeah so if you haven't seen Contact go ahead and watch it <laughs> I always say that Ah uh, dear. Anyway, across the Barry, VK3 November Zulu Charlie, VK3 EKH. Yes, Chris. Good, uh, good broadcast, mate. Probably the strongest I've heard your signal for a long while. 5 9 plus 30 dB at times. So, um, yeah, nice, nice signal. And, uh, yeah, as always, good broadcast. Been listening for years. I suppose a lot of people do that don't call in. And just a quick comment. Uh, good evening, Ian, too. Um, I spoke to you last week, this is my third contact on this radio, of, um, I'm using a uh, Collins KWM2 1960 model, um, so it uh, doesn't get much of a chance at the moment, HF is pretty dead, but uh, I enjoy listening to your broadcast. Anyway, just a short one for me, but uh, good signal, good broadcast. Okay, three is it, so. Thanks, Barry. VK3NZC, VK3EKH returning. Very good. I like your Collins uh, setup. If uh, I'm, I'm, you're probably not watching the YouTube feed, but um, just on my over my uh, uh, left shoulder uh, are two Collins units uh, that I have um, in the background there: a receiver and transmitter. Uh, Thirty. Can never remember the numbers on them. Thirty-two uh, S. I think it was the one number and the other one's the 75 uh, or S something. Uh, I never remember it. I'm trying to organize a, uh, a power amplifier, a 30L one, um, very soon, so to uh, marry up with it. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, very very nice uh, equipment that, and uh, it sits nicely above the 9000D. <laughs> one extreme to the other. Anyway, thanks, Barry. Uh, you're, uh, you're 5 and 9, peaking about uh, 10, not uh, super strong, but the band is quiet tonight. So, uh, yeah, good uh, good copy without a problem. And, um, yeah, thanks for, for listening in and uh, coming back. Much appreciated across the bay, uh, across the bay there. All right, uh, now, was there anybody else wishing to report in tonight, VK3 EKH? Uh, 
Key Alpha. Address to me, we're checking in the VK3 VAT. Flight lots for me. Ah, uh, dear. All right, VK5 Whiskey Alpha and VK3 VAT. G'day, Tony. Uh, go ahead, VK5 WA, VK3 EKH. Yeah, no worries, Dallas. I, I, I got, my memory is like a sieve. Uh, I just don't retain stuff. But um, thanks, Dallas. Good to hear you, mate. VK five WA, VK three EKH. Yeah, good signal. Ten over nine, uh, ten over nine, and uh, we're we're not hearing the lightning static. Um, strangely enough, um, it's fairly, fairly quiet here. So um, uh, no, it's uh, you're coming through loud and clear. Good to hear, Dallas. Thanks for the comments and. Um, uh, as uh, as Barry sort of said, uh, there's uh, obviously a, a, a number of stations and folks out there that uh, uh, that listen in, but they don't always uh, make themselves known, and that's 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 okay. <laughs> um, that's why I've got the email address. So if you wish to send a report via email, they can vk3 ek yeah vk3 ekh at gmail dot com is what it is. And uh, the chat window that I've got there, the Discord chat window, and there's actually a few people up there on the chat window too. Uh, Richard VK3 VRS, I think he's had to disappear uh, tonight. Um, there's um, uh, oh yeah, Daz, our resident shortwave listener up in Brisbane, he's at, uh, he's there too, and. Uh, I think that's it actually. There's not many stations that folks that came up on the chat window tonight. It's been quiet there too. I think everybody went off to listen to the Dick Smith interview. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thanks, Dallas. Good to hear. Um, and uh, Tony, VK3 VAT, probably on 5 watts. VK3 EKH. Uh, yeah, VK3 EKH, yeah, VK3 VAT, yep, still on 5 watts. So no one can probably hear me. Not that it matters too much. I think they're probably all out trying to uh, look at the moon, which isn't very successful tonight. And I think we missed the meteor shower. I think that was last night, wasn't it? I know the little Davis weather station knows that comes up and tells you about it. Really? Um, so it's interesting, but um, unfortunately I missed both of them. VK3, EKH, VK3, BAT. They press the wrong button. Um, VK3 VAT, about two and a half kilometres away from me. <laughs> VK3 EKH. All right, Tony, good on you, mate. Um, I didn't realise that. Um, I'll have to take a, another look at that. The uh, weather station telling us that there's a, a meteor shower. I know I, uh, I, I did report a meteor shower last week. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, 19th, yeah, we'll be peaking around about now, too, or t probably tomorrow morning. So, um, Hmm. But yeah, unfortunately, the lunar eclipse, the lunar partial lunar eclipse, uh, was a no no show here in Melbourne. The unfortunately, the cloud cover has been really uh, really bad for us. Oh dear. Um. All right. Okay. If there's no other stations, I'll just have a quick one more quick listen. VK3 EKH. Yes, there's a little bit of lightning static there. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for listening in and uh, tuning in to the uh, wireless and the TV wireless system. And uh, um, it's been a quite an interesting little night. Look at that, we've uh, gone to, well, it's been normal, 25 past 11, yeah. All right, this is VK3 EKH. On behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, any information about the ASV can be found going to the website at www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. Um, we're um, not too far away from the star BQ uh, this year because of the, like unlike uh, last year where the star BQ was closed uh, or cancelled due to COVID. Uh, this year we're um, the ASV are going full bore to uh, to get folks up at uh, the party for uh, for the, the for the night. So hopefully the weather will be good because uh, 
when it comes to setting up something like a star barbecue, the, the, the thing that we're all hoping for is good weather, and generally it is, but uh, with the way the weather's been here uh, in, uh, in Melbourne the, the last uh, few weeks, it, it could be any anything come the 11th of December, I think it's the 11th of December. Anyway, all right, um, cheers everyone, take care, look after yourself, and uh, we'll see you all next week. This is VK3 EKH, um, Martin's just in the report. Noise levels are very high on 80 meters. Try next week. Okay, no worries, uh, Martin. Um, yep, yeah, not a problem at all. Thanks uh, for uh, calling in there on the chat window. This is VK3 EKH on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding transmissions tonight on 3541 kilohertz and elsewhere. And we'll see you all next Friday at 10 o'clock. Please take care, VK3 EKH. All right. So, we shall conclude transmissions on YouTube. Thanks for watching YouTube, and uh, we'll, um, uh, again, oh, and don't forget the WIA broadcast. Yes, I'm doing the WIA broadcast on Friday, sorry, Sunday morning at uh, 10.30, uh, and uh, I think that's it, that'll all be that, yeah. So, I look forward to that. So, YouTube, close the YouTube. Cheers everyone on 